Hi everyone, in this lesson we are going to do examples of tank mixing problems. Here's the context. Imagine that we have a tank containing some kind of fluid. What we're going to do is have two taps, one which adds fluid to the tank and one which drains fluid from the tank. It's possible in some tank mixing problems that the inflow is faster than the outflow so that your tank is slowly filling up. In other situations, maybe we're draining the tank faster than we're adding fluid to the tank so that the tank's volume would be decreasing over time. But what we're going to talk about are situations where the inflow rate and the outflow rate are the same. That way the volume of the tank is not changing over time. What we do with these problems is we want to see how the concentration of some kind of substance, like a salty water or a pollutant, those will be the two examples that we look at today, where it could be antifreeze or sugar water or something like that. Uh, we want to see how some sort of substance is changing over time. For example, what we could do is start with a tank that is pure water. And uh, the inflow pipe is going to be adding some kind of salty mixture the tank is going to stir instantaneously. That's always assumption that we make with tank mixing problems is we imagine that as soon as the salty water hits the tank, it's just immediately dispersed throughout the tank. Then we drain out what is going to become an increasingly salty mixture of fluid. So that's one situation. You're, you're starting with, say, pure water, and you're going to increase its salinity by adding a salty mixture to the tank. You could also go the other direction, which is what we'll do with our second example. You could start with something which is like a salty mixture. Then maybe you are adding pure water to this tank so that over time the salinity level is decreasing. So those are two situations which we often look at with tank mixing problems, either increasing the quantity of a substance which appears in the tank or decreasing that quantity. With tank mixing, uh, these are classic word problems. I think it's really helpful to identify these four concepts whenever you start a new tank mixing problem. So the first one is, what is the volume of the tank? And as you answer that question and all of these other questions, I really recommend that you keep track of units. So I would never do one of these problems without identifying the units at play. With volume of a tank, uh, we would be looking at, say, liters and SI units. Since I'm a fan of SI units, both of the examples today will be in liters, but you could also see something like gallons. So we might look at something like a 50 liter tank, and we just want to keep that number and that unit in mind. The next quantity to recognize is the amount of the substance. We will call this A of T, for A for amount, T because it's going to be changing over time. This is a quantity. It could be something like uh, kilograms of salt or pounds of salt. Those are common units that you would associate to the amount of the substance. So like how many kilograms of salt appear in this tank or how many pounds of sugar appear in this tank. So it's like a mass or weight. It's like a quantity of the substance. The next quantity to track, or maybe I shouldn't use the word quantity because I just did, but the next concept that we want to keep an eye on is the concentration of this quantity. I will call this C of T. It's concentration. It's like a ratio. It's part per whole. So if we are looking at kilograms of salt in a 50 liter tank, the concentration unit would be kilograms per liter. It's like, how much, what's the saltiness of the tank? If it were pounds of sugar in a 10 gallon tank, the concentration unit would be pounds per gallon. One example that we will see today, actually, we're just gonna look at two examples. So the second example will have the substance that we're tracking is also a fluid. So actually its quantity will be liters. We'll have liters of pollutant in a tank which is measured in liters, whose volume is measured in liters. That means that the concentration is liters per liter, and that is often given as a percentage. Okay, so I'm just gonna write like liters per liter there, but the idea is that we will be looking at a uh, fluid pollutant in water, and we will be measuring the, the concentration of that pollutant as a percentage. So what percentage of this fluid is the pollutant? That's how we'll track its concentration. 
And then the last thing to think about is the rate that uh, fluid is entering the tank and the rate that fluid is exiting the tank. So the rate for us will be both, both of those quantities will be the same because our volume for these tanks are not, are not gonna be changing. But just to, to tell you the notation that I like, I call it R sub N for rate N and R sub out for rate out. This, by the way, is volume V. There, I've named everything with, with symbols. Rate is going to be uh, something like liter per minute or gallon per minute. I think both of our examples in this lesson are measured in minutes, but it could be seconds or hours. It's a unit of time in the denominator. And then in the numerator, it's a fluid measurement. So it's like, what's the rate that this fluid is entering the tank? That's the rate in. And since it's a fluid entering the tank, we would be measuring that rate in liters per minute or gallons per minute or whatever the appropriate measurement is. Okay, let me just pause for a second so that you can think of each of these. Then what I'm going to do before we start our first example is write down the guiding differential equation that we will use in order to come up with an expression tracking the amount of our substance over time and also the concentration of our substance over time. Now that we've identified the major ideas in a tank mixing problem, let's write down the differential equation for this function a of t measuring the quantity of the substance we're tracking. That quantity, again, is something like sugar or salt, whatever is being either brought into the tank to increase its concentration or perhaps being drained out of the tank. Okay, so what we're going to do is just write down the differential equation, then I'm going to identify each of the components using the standard SI units. You could set it up with different units, but just to give you a representative example, let's assume for the equation I'm about to write down that we are tracking, say, kilograms of salt in a tank which is being measured in liters so that the concentration of the salt in the tank is kilograms per liter. And then we will have, say, liters coming in, such and such a number of liters coming in per minute. Okay, so those are going to be the units that we will write down for each of the quantities in this differential equation, but here it is. We say that the rate of change of the amount of our salt with respect to time. So how does that amount change? It's a balancing act between what's coming in and what's going out. What's coming in, we will say, is the concentration in times the rate in. And what's going out is the concentration out times the rate out. Okay, so this is our guiding differential equation for any of these tank mixing problems. Couple remarks here. One is if the volume is unchanging, the rate in and the rate out are going to be the same. I like to identify each of them individually though, just to keep the general tank mixing process in mind. Uh, let's go ahead and write down the units and then I have a remark to make about concentration out. But what are the units here? Well, the rate of change of the quantity with respect to time is going to be kilograms per unit of time. So this unit here for the left-hand side is kilograms per minute for the situation that I sketched out. Concentration in, so what's the saltiness of what's coming into the tank? That's going to be kilograms per liter in this demonstration. So kilograms per liter. If this is what's coming in, if this is the saltiness of what's coming in, well, how much is coming in per unit of time? That's the rate in, and that's what we're calling liters per minute. And then we have the same units for the concentration out and the rate out. So kilograms per liter and liter per minute. You can see overall the right-hand size unit is kilograms per minute, which matches the left-hand side so that this equation is dimensionally consistent. Okay, what we're going to do in our examples is solve this equation, but before we do that, I need to say something about the concentration out. When we look at a tank mixing problem, we assume that the tank is always being instantaneously stirred. So it's like if you have pure water, as soon as the salty water hits that fluid, the tank, it's just immediately dispersed throughout the tank. That means that whatever's coming out of the drain represents the fluid in the tank. It has the same saltiness as the fluid in the tank. Let me just write that down. So note, concentration out, the concentration in the outflow pipe 
is identical to the concentration in the tank. So that's worth writing out. That concentration is changing over time and we've given it a name. C of T represents the concentration in the tank over time, which is now we know identical to the concentration in the outflow pipe. So in particular, we can say that uh, C out, we really expect that to change over time. So it's going to be the same thing as the concentration in the tank. But what is this concentration in the tank? Well, again, concentration is like the saltiness measurement. It's part per whole. How much salt is in the fluid? So we're looking for something like kilograms per liter as the associated unit. Well, well, how much kilograms of salt in the tank is exactly what we're calling A of T. So if I want to measure the concentration of, say, salt in this tank, I'm looking at how much salt is in the tank divided by how much fluid is in the tank. So this is going to be the A of T over the volume of the tank. That's that constant volume. It's the first thing we identify is just what's the volume of the tank. That's going to be the denominator here. For this situation I've sketched out, again, the concentration unit is kilograms per liter. Let's just make sure that agrees with what we've written down here. The amount of salt or sugar, whatever we're measuring in our tank, we're doing it with SI units. That's going to be kilograms in the numerator. And then the volume of our tank in SI units would be liters. Okay. We have two examples to do. In the first one, we're going to start with a tank of pure water, and then we are going to add a salty mixture to it. So we will see the salinity of our tank increase over time. In the second example, we are going to start with a tank that has some pollutant in it, and we're going to kind of flush it out. So we're going to pure, put pure water in the inflow pipe and have the instantaneously mixed fluid drained so that we would expect the pollutant to decrease over time. So those are going to be the two situations we look at examples one and two. Let me step aside and then we will pick up with example one. Here's our first example. A 50 liter tank contains pure water. A mixture with 0.2 kilograms of salt per liter begins to flow into this tank at a rate of seven liters per minute. The solution is instantaneously mixed and flows out at a rate of seven liters per minute. Before we start to solve through this problem, let's just talk through this prompt one more time. And I would like to identify those key pieces of information that we just talked through. The first one is the volume of the tank. So where's the volume of the tank in this problem? So right at the start, we were told that our tank is 50 liters. So this is the volume for our tank. Sorry, I wrote the V there kind of over the next line, but that's okay. So that's our volume. So our second sentence tells us that the mixture coming in has 0.2 kilograms of salt per liter. That means that our amount is going to be looking for kilograms of salt. That's what we're going to be computing when we do A of T, kilograms of salt. Let me write that here. Okay. Next, we talked about the concentration. So the concentration coming into the tank is what we get straight from the problem. The concentration coming in is this 0.2 kilograms of salt per liter. So that's here. And this is telling us that our concentration in, let me just write it right here, is 0.2 kilograms per liter. The rate coming in is the same as the rate going out, and that is seven liters per minute that's here. Okay, so our seven liters per minute is both the rate in and the rate out. All of that information came straight from the problem. The one that you always have to stop and think about is the concentration going out because that reflects the concentration of the entire tank due to the instantaneous mixing. 
And that is something that's changing over time because we're either increasing the salinity or decreasing the salinity depending on what's happening in the problem. Here we're increasing the salinity. So we expect the concentration of salt in the tank to be going up over time. And this concentration in the tank, which is identical to C out, this is going to be the amount in the tank, that's the function A of T, divided by that volume 50. Okay, so those are the four terms that we will need to set up when we create the differential equation in a few minutes to uh, find the function modeling the amount of salt in this tank. Let's talk through what else we're going to do in this exercise. So we're going to come up with the function that computes kilograms of salt at time t. We're going to get that by solving this differential equation. There's something here that we haven't mentioned yet, and that is that these problems are initial value problems because we're not starting, you know, we're starting with a specific tank. We're looking at a, a real situation here. So what is the initial amount of salt in the tank? What is A of zero? Hopefully you thought back to the first sentence in this problem, and we initially started with pure water. That means that when t equals zero, we didn't have any salt in the tank. So our initial condition on the amount of salt is that A of zero is zero. Okay, so that's the first thing we wanna do is set up and solve this differential equation to find the amount of salt uh, in the tank at time t. The next exercise is to find the concentration in the tank as a function of time. This is actually easy if you already have the amount because the concentration is just the amount divided by the volume. So C of t, we get that just from taking the function that we find in our first exercise, A of t, and dividing it by 50. Okay. The next exercise we will do with these functions once we have them, and that is that we will take the limit of each as t goes to infinity. But I claim that we can already answer this question now if we just think about what happens as you stir a fluid and maybe add sugar to it over time, it gets sweeter and sweeter to a point, right? So let me let you think about this for a minute before I tell you what we predict our functions will return to us as the limits of these two functions. Okay, here's the thing with the concentration over time. We have pure water and we start to put a salty mixture into it. So initially it's gonna be mostly pure water, but we stir it instantaneously and then we drain out the current concentration. As that's happening, salty mixture is coming in, stirring instantaneously, draining out whatever's currently in the tank. Basically, we're adding to the saltiness for all time, right? So you expect this mixture to get saltier and saltier. However, it will never be saltier than what we're putting in. So it's like uh, we imagine that we keep increasing the salinity by adding to it with this inflow pipe, but we're not going to exceed the concentration of salt uh, compared to what we're putting into it. So what we expect is for the saltiness of this fluid to just increase up to the kind of pure saltiness that we're putting in. Okay, I don't know if I said that very well, but we will see it from the mathematical equation. The idea is that the limit as t goes to infinity of the concentration should be equal to the concentration that's coming in. And that is this 0.2 kilograms per liter. Eventually by continuing to flush out what's at, whatever's in the tank and add to it the salty mixture, we're gonna get closer and closer to that salty mixture itself. That's the idea. But we know how the amount of salt and the concentration of the salt relate to each other. So that means that we can also immediately reason how much uh, salt we just see in this, the tank as t goes to infinity. So the limit as t goes to infinity of a of t is going to be this times 50. So imagine bringing that 50 over. So that is going to be 10 kilograms of salt. Okay, so that's the expected long-term behavior that our solution should give us. Then the last, last exercise here is to answer the question, when will there be six kilograms of salt in the tank? That just means setting up the correct equation and then solving it. So this is like an algebra exercise. When will there be six kilograms of salt? Well, six kilograms of salt is a, an amount. So basically we want to find T so that A of T equals six.
right here is our first order differential equation for the amount of salt in this tank with respect to time. So we have dA dt on the left-hand side. That is going to equal 0.2 times 7 minus A over 50 times 7. If we're assuming that the rate in and the rate out are always the same number, then I can actually factor that in front. I'm going to do that in this case. So I'm going to pull this 7 here and here in front and write 0.2 minus A over 50. A over 50, actually, I'm going to write that as a decimal as well. 1 over 50 is 2 over 100, so this is 0 0.02a. Okay. I am going to divide, or I'm going to pull out 0 0.02. I'm just trying to make my numbers as nice as possible. You could work with this, but I'm going to bring that 0 0.02 in front. That's going to make this leading coefficient 0 0.14. 0.2 divided by 0.02 is uh, 10, so 10 minus A. What I would like for you to do now, looking at this differential equation, is identify any equilibrium solutions. So an equilibrium solution for this differential equation is a value of a, which is constant, and causes dA dt to be zero. In other words, a would maintain that constant value for all time. There's one equilibrium solution to this differential equation, and that is a equals 10. If a equals 10, then this term is zero, which means dA dt is zero. So if the amount of salt is 10 kilograms, then we would not see any change in that amount of salt over time. If you think about why in the context of this problem, well, having 10 kilograms of salt in a tank with 50 liters is like having a concentration in the tank of 0.2 kilograms per liter. That means that the salinity in the tank is the same as the salinity as what's coming in, so we're not changing the salinity. We're just putting in exactly the consistency that we already have, so there would be no increase or decrease in the salinity of the tank. So that's why A equals 10 would be a uh, equilibrium solution to this differential equation. Okay, I just wanted to talk through that. I always like to try to connect that back to the situation at hand, but now that we're looking at this equation, let's solve it. It is a separable differential equation. Anytime the rate coming in and the rate going out are the same, it should be separable. So that's the situation we have here where the volume is not changing. We can take this 10 minus A, bring that over to partner that with the DA term, bring the DT to the other side so that this turns into anti-differentiating one over 10 minus A with respect to A on the left. And on the right, we will have 0 0.14 DT in the other integral. All right, so on the left, we have to anti-differentiate that. One over 10 minus A, the antiderivative of that is a natural log. This is going to be natural log of the absolute value of 10 minus A. Uh, I'm not done here because if you were to differentiate that, it would be one over 10 minus A times negative one. It's a really easy mistake to make. In fact, um, as I was working on this problem before making this video, I forgot that and then I was not puzzled by my final answer. So don't forget this. Um, I did that earlier, so there's a negative out there. Okay, so we have negative natural log of the absolute value of 10 minus A on the left. On the right, we have 0 0.14 T plus our first constant. So there's the constant of integration. Now we need to isolate A in this equation. If you'd like, you can pause and work that out on your own. This is the type of equation that we've seen looking at separable differential equations. So can you isolate A? How do you handle these absolute values? See if you can work through that. In the meantime, I'm going to step aside and erase this so I can come back in and finish the problem. All right, let's see if you got the same thing I'm about to work out. The first thing I'm going to do is multiply the left and right hand sides by negative one. We handle that leading negative there. So let's say natural log of the absolute value of 10 minus A is going to be negative 0.14T. And then I will write minus C1. 
All right, now we need to isolate A inside this natural log. So the way to do that is to take E and raise it to the left and right hand sides. When we exponentiate the left hand side, we are left with an absolute value of 10 minus A. And on the right hand side, using uh, exponent properties, I can write this as E to the negative 0.14T times e to the negative c1. This is just a constant. It's a positive constant the way that we've written it right now because e to any power is a positive number. But what we're going to do is drop the absolute values. And when we do that, we allow the, the left-hand side to be positive or negative. So I'm going to take this constant and replace it with something called C2, which is going to be essentially plus or minus e to the negative C1. It's going to represent this quantity and absorb the sign of the left-hand side. So that's how we've handled this absolute value situation in the past, and that's what we're going to do now. So I will say that this is now going to be 10 minus A. And on the right, let me write this first, C2 e to the negative 0.14t where C2 is like plus or minus e to the negative C1. This also allows a to be 10 and C2 could be zero. Um, so this is our nice general way to, to handle this. We just need now to isolate a. If I brought this over to the right, I would have a, and then I would bring this over to the left, so 10 minus C2e to the negative 0.14t. Okay, so I isolated a, but I put a on the left-hand side. This is the general solution to the differential equation, but we had an initial value problem because we knew that when t was zero, there was no salt in the tank. So to find C2, so that we have a, a solution to the initial value problem, we can say that a of zero was zero kilograms of salt in the tank. Put in zero for t, and we get 10 minus C2 e to the zero. But e to the zero is one, so this is 10 minus C2. Okay. Zero equals 10 minus C2 tells us C2 is 10. All right, so now we can say that the overall amount of salt in the tank with respect to time is A of T is 10 minus 10 e to the negative 0.14 t. Oh, sorry, I was trying to make my four look good and I made it look bad. There we go. Okay, so this function a of t reflects the amount of salt in kilograms in the tank over time. Let's just check two situations. Let's verify that we have the correct initial condition. We should because we just solved it, but let's just plug in and check. So what is A of zero? If I let T equal zero on the right-hand side, E to the zero is one. So we get 10 minus 10, that's zero kilograms of salt. That's correct. Let's talk about that long-term behavior as T goes to infinity. We already reasoned out just by thinking about the physical situation of stirring one fluid into another that the long-term behavior for the amount of salt should be 10 kilograms. Do we see that here? We do, because as T grows to infinity, this is an increasingly negative number. So it's like E to the something going towards negative infinity, but that's, that's going to go to zero. So this expression goes to zero as T goes to infinity. So the long-term behavior for the amount of salt in our tank is 10 minus zero, so indeed 10 kilograms of salt. Now that we have the amount of salt in our tank over time, we've done most of the work for this problem. So let me step aside and I'll erase all of this. We will come back and discuss the concentration. Moving on to the rest of the question now. Given that we did all that work to find the amount of salt uh, with respect to time, we can say what the concentration is. So that's A of T divided by 50, which is going to be 
10 minus 10 e to the negative 0.14 t divided by 50. And you could leave it that way. Or you could say that uh, 10 over 50 is 0 0.2, 0 0.2 minus 0 0.2 e to the negative 0 0.14 t. So this, this function gives us the concentration of the salt in the tank with respect to time. What is the initial concentration? Let's plug in t equals zero, e to the zero becomes one, and the initial concentration is 0.2 minus 0.2, which is zero. And that makes sense because we started with pure water. The other thing that we wanna consider to make sure that this function, function matches our expectations is let's take the limit of C of t as t goes to infinity. As t goes to infinity, once again, this exponential expression goes to zero. Which means, just like we predicted, the concentration over time will increasingly approach the concentration of what we're putting into the tank, which is 0.2. So the limit of the concentration as t goes to infinity is 0 0.2 kilograms per liter. Like that. We already worked out that the long-term amount of salt in the tank is going to be 10 kilograms, which agrees with a concentration of 0.2 kilograms per liter. Okay, the last thing to do is set up and solve this uh, problem right here. So we would like to know when, at what time value, we would have six kilograms of salt. If you're not confident with word problems, the first thing you wanna do is, is assess what is six kilograms? What type of statement is that? It's a statement about the amount of salt. So if we're saying six kilograms of salt, that's an amount. So we want to find T so that a of t equals six, six kilograms. We know how to find A of t or we've already found it. So let's set A of t equal to six and isolate t. So let's see, I think I'll do it over here to the right just to have room. Six is the amount we're interested in. We're trying to find the time. So 10 minus 10 e to the negative 0.14 t. Trying to isolate t here. So let me move that over, move that over. We will have 10 e to the negative 0.14 t equals 4. Divide both sides by 10, and we have e to the negative 0.14 t is 0 0.4. So far, so good. We need to isolate t here. In order to get that, we will take the natural log of both sides. Let me, sorry, I'm kind of running out of room here. Let me move to the right. Taking the natural log of both sides of this equation, when we take the natural log of e to the negative 0.14t, we're just going to capture that exponent because natural log is the inverse of the exponential function. So zero, or sorry, negative. Negative 0.14t is natural log of 0.4. Divide both sides by negative 0.14. T is natural log 0.4 divided by negative 0.14. And I did approximate that. It's about six and a half minutes. Okay, so to wrap up this problem, we started with zero kilograms of salt in the tank. We had pure water. Then when we began this process of letting a salty mixture flow in, instantaneously mixing it and letting the tank drain at the same rate that we were bringing new fluid into the tank. After about six and a half minutes, we went from zero kilograms of salt to six kilograms of salt in the tank. And then long-term, if we could let time grow to infinity, we would approach having 10 kilograms of salt in the tank. Okay, that wraps up this example. We have one more example to look at.
as you read through this example, it might sound a little different than the previous example, but I promise it's going to be the same differential equation that we're going to set up for the amount of the uh, substance in this problem. So let's take a look at what we're being told here. We have a reservoir that has a capacity of 25 liters. That's a pretty small reservoir, but let's just work with it. Initially, we know that our reservoir is 20% pollutant, which sounds bad. But what we're going to do is let fresh water flow into this reservoir at a rate of three liters per minute. We imagine it's all instantaneously mixed and we have some outflow pipe that's going to take the mixture out at the same rate of three liters per minute. Realistically, what you can imagine, like what's the goal here? We're trying to flush the pollutant out of the reservoir. So we have some polluted reservoir. And we're putting fresh water in and draining out the current mixture. The idea is that the more the fresh water goes in, the cleaner the water is. Hopefully we're not ever going to have to drink this, but the idea is that we're going to reduce the pollutant down. Okay, so we want to answer these two questions ultimately, so we'll keep this in mind. In liters, how much pollutant is in the reservoir after five minutes? And then when will the mixture be 10% pollutant? We started with 20%, so when will we be down to 10%? Okay, before we start trying to write down a differential equation, I'd like to take a moment just to identify the key concepts in this problem. I think the easiest one to identify, but it's always worth spotting, is what is the volume of the tank? In this problem, we're told that the volume of the tank is 25 liters. So we'll just keep this in mind. This is our tank volume. Then we want to think about things like what is the rate in and what is the rate out? That's three liters per minute for both. Think so. What is the concentration in? Think about that for a second. So what's the concentration of the substance, the pollutant in this case, that we're bringing into this reservoir? The concentration in is going to be zero because we're, we're bringing in fresh water. We're trying to flush the pollutant out of this reservoir. So C sub n, when I write down the equation, is going to be zero. Okay, I think we have enough to go ahead and write down the differential equation for the amount of pollutant in this reservoir as a function of time. We have one number here I haven't talked about yet, and that is the 20%, which might surprise you too to see this percentage, like how do we interpret that? But let me uh, readdress that in a second. Let's just go ahead and start with dA dt which will be the rate of change for the pollutant with respect to time. So dA dt, just like in the previous exercise, it's the concentration in times the rate in minus the concentration out times the rate out. Let's identify here the units associated with each of these measurements. Starting on the right-hand side, the concentration in, we know it's going to be zero. Um, let me start actually with the rate in for that reason. Okay, so what is the unit associated to rate in? It's liters per minute. Same thing with rate out, liters per minute. Okay, for the concentration, in this problem, what we have is pollutant, which is actually being measured in liters. So we have like liters of some chemical mixed into say liters of pure water. So the concentration is actually liters per liter. That's why we're actually being told a measurement of pollutant in percentage, which is like a unitless measurement because uh, we're really just interested in what percentage of the total liters are the liters of pollutant. So it's like a liters of pollutant in a liter of a mixture, which is pollutant and fluid. Okay, so that's the situation in this problem. And that's why it's sensible to talk about the concentration as a percentage. All right, so the rate of change of the amount with respect to time is liters per minute. So our amount of pollutant here is being measured in liters, time is being measured in minutes. All right, we will solve this, but let me mention, well, actually, I was gonna go ahead and talk about the initial condition, but let me save that for the end. That's going to involve this 20% because that's measuring how much pollutant we're starting with when we start bringing fresh water into this tank or this reservoir. But before we do that, let's just go ahead and set up and solve this differential equation. So we've got dA dt equals concentration in is zero, so let's just write zero. Concentration out, just like in the previous exercise and like we discussed at the very beginning of this lesson, that's the overall amount of pollutant 
that's what we're calling A, divided by the volume of the tank, which is 25. Okay, so that's the concentration out. Notice that's liter divided by liter. That matches our units for concentration. And then the rate out is three. Okay, so that is our differential equation for the amount. Take a look at this. Let me rewrite it one more time. This is going to be negative 3 25ths, or if you like, that's negative 0.12a. Okay, what kind of differential equation is this? For one thing, it's separable. This is a separable differential equation, and if you wanted to solve this from scratch, you could use the separation of variables technique. But it's also a very famous differential equation. So if you look at this, you should recognize what type of function solves the situation where we're saying the derivative of it, the function is just a number times the function itself. That's a very famous differential equation. Do you see it? It's exponential decay. So this is like exponential decay. I'm saying decay here because this number is negative. All right, that means that I can immediately write down the solution to this differential equation. Again, if you wanted to, to get to it through the technique of separation of variables, that's fine. But we know that the solution to the exponential decay problem that we're going to look at is the uh, amount with respect to time is the initial amount times e to the negative 0.12t. Okay, let me give you a second to digest this and you know catch up. Again, if you'd like to solve this by hand without referring to the fact that it's, it's an exponential decay differential equation, you can do that. Now, the next thing we wanna do is figure out what to put here for the initial amount. And that's going to be related to this 20%. So think over that for a second, and then I will come back and say how we should handle that. If initially the mixture that we had in this reservoir was 20% pollutant, that means 20% of the 25 liters of fluid was this chemical pollutant. So we can say that A of zero, the initial amount of pollutant was 20% 20 of 25 liters. Not 25. Percent here is unitless. So when we take 20% of 25 liters, the resulting unit is just liters. So that's giving us a measurement for the pollutant in liters. What is 20% of 25? That's going to be five, five liters. You can check if there was five liters of the pollutant in a 25 liter reservoir, then that means five over 25 was the ratio of the pollutant to the entire reservoir. And that is 20%. So this 20% here is like the initial concentration in the reservoir. Okay, but that's actually exactly our A sub zero. So now we can say, let me just write it one more time down here, that the amount of pollutant in our tank as a function of time is five e to the negative 0.12t. What is the long-term behavior? I didn't ask it here, but you know I love to do this. So if t goes to infinity, what would happen to our pollutant? Well, as t goes to infinity, this goes to zero. And again, that should make sense if you think about the situation here. We have some polluted reservoir. Again, I don't wanna to think too much about what's going on here, but we're trying to flush this pollutant out by just continually putting in fresh water, mixing it and draining out the mixture. So it's like, if you just kept flushing it, eventually you would start to see the reservoir look more and more like pure water. And that's what this is telling us, that as time goes to infinity, we would flush out the pollutant and get back to pure water. Uh, initially, of course, you can check that as well, just to make sure you did this right. Uh, when, when t is zero, we get five liters as expected. So this function models the amount of pollutant over time. Okay, I think we're ready to answer this first question here. So in liters, how much pollutant is in the reservoir after five minutes? For that, we wanna do A of five. Let me see where I can fit this in here. So let me let you copy this down and then I'm gonna come back and do that, but see if you can work out what A of five is.
All right, I didn't leave you with a very challenging exercise there. So we just literally plug in five for T. So A of five, let me see if I can squeeze it here. That's going to be five times E to the negative 0 0.12 times five. And that number is approximately 2.74 liters of pollutant. Quick follow-up question. What would be the concentration after five minutes? What you could do is take 2.74, divide it by 25. That gives you the concentration. And it would make sense to express that number as a percentage. So whatever this is, divided by 25, and then turn that into a percentage. OK, on that note, let's look at this final question, which is when will the mixture be 10% pollutant? For that, we're looking at having a concentration of 0.1. So for this problem, what we want to do is first perhaps write down the concentration as a function of time. The concentration of, as a function of time is the amount divided by the tank, the volume. Switch markers. So uh, we're going to have this expression divided by 25. 5 over 25 uh, is 0.2. So 0 0.2 e to the negative 0.12 t. That is our concentration over time. Now we'd like to know when is that equal to 0.1. This isn't going to take a lot of room, but let me just work it out over here. So give me a second and I will erase this and then we will finish this exercise. Okay, now we have plenty of room to finish this exercise. But before we do that, since we just wrote down this function that represents the concentration of this pollutant over time, let's check a couple of things. So first, what is C of zero? What is the initial concentration? When we put in T equals zero, this exponential term becomes one in the usual way. So we are looking at a concentration of 0.2. That's our 20%, there it is. So our initial concentration is 20%, 0.2. What happens to the concentration as T goes to infinity? So what is the long-term expectation for the concentration of the pollutant in this reservoir? Now, hopefully, as soon as I said that, you were like zero because we're trying to flush out the pollutant with fresh water. And that is exactly what this function tells us. As t goes to infinity, this exponential goes to zero. So we have a long-term prediction for our concentration of zero. OK, so just wanted to run through those key behaviors. We are looking for when the concentration is 10%. In a decimal, that's like 0.1. So we will say, when is the concentration 0 0.1? 0 0.1 on the left-hand side, our function on the right. And we need to solve for t. OK. 0.1 divided by 0 0.2 is a half, right, 0 0.5. To isolate t, let's take the natural log of both sides. Natural log of a half on the left. And on the right, we will just capture this exponent, negative 0.12t. I had to step away just for a second to crunch this number. So uh, what is t? As an exact answer, t is natural log of a half divided by negative 0 0.12. And then if you'd like to see that as an approximation, it's about 5.78 minutes. We already talked about what happens after five minutes. So actually 2.74 liters out of 25 total liters is approximately 11%. And that makes sense. So we went from 20% when time was zero to 11% at five minutes, and then at 5.78 minutes, so just a little bit later, we went down to 10%. Long term, we hope to go down to 0% so that we've flushed this pollutant out of this reservoir. OK, so that concludes our look at tank mixing in this lesson. I hope you enjoyed uh, how to set up these problems and how to evaluate them. So the idea is always that the rate of change of the amount of your substance, whether it's salt, sugar, uh, antifreeze, 
gluten, what have you, whatever it is that you're tracking over time, the rate of change of that quantity with respect to time is the rate n times the concentration n minus the rate out times the concentration out. If you're looking at a problem like this, you should also be able to spot an initial condition. You set that up and solve it, and then we get the amount with respect to time, we can get the concentration with respect to time, and we can answer these types of follow-up questions.